Hi, I'm Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. Well, last week, Justin Peters and Chris Roseboro responded to something that was said on the Remnant Radio concerning prophets having assurance that they were hearing from God. Here's the Remnant clip followed by the response clip. Moses got to hear God face to face, uh, whereas Joshua didn't have that kind of interaction with God. It would often come, and along with all the other prophets and the, the subsequent line of prophets throughout Israel, none of them would speak with God face to face. Um, I think of like, you know, Jeremiah, who's one of the great prophets. Um, in Jeremiah 32, you see Jeremiah, uh, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Go and buy this field that's in Anathoth. You have the right of redemption to purchase it. So he goes, he makes his way over to Anathoth. He runs into his uncle's son, also known as his cousin, uh, who tells him, Hey, buy this field that's in Anathoth. You have a right of redemption to purchase it. The land is yours. And then it says these interesting words. Then I knew it was the Lord. Um, but then you've also got just a number of other prophecies with Jeremiah. Like he says, he looks over there and he sees a... a but Miller, so unpack that for see? a second. Then I knew it was the Lord. Why, why are you bringing that up? Because is, it's because that Jeremiah didn't know that the word of the Lord that came to him was in fact the word of the Lord. Like I just right. want to make and sure that the listener out. didn't skip past that. Jeremiah, the prophet who wrote one of the biggest prophetic books in the Bible, had God speaking to him and he didn't know it was God speaking to him until he acted on what God told him to say and do. When they say, you see the video, right? It's super clear. You see, oh, God's word comes into their head and then right out their mouth. But they don't mention any of the process that's happening in their head because it's not like God is speaking word for word as man speaks to man face to face. He's actually speaking in a vision. And so this thing is kind of lodged in his head until God comes with another revelation and gives him an interpretation. And then oftentimes he's like, what do you want me to do with this? Oh, well, right. go Jeremiah and speak, and they're still not going to listen to you. Right. <laughs> so it's, well, it's, and, there's and a whole lot fair, there. Like, I, I'm sure you would agree. Sometimes it would come in a vision. Sometimes it would come in a dream. Uh, sometimes it, it might come in sentence structure, you know? Uh, right. So like when they say the word of the Lord came to me, it probably did come in some kind of, we don't really know. It actually doesn't tell us how it came. Does that mean that they saw sentences? That they, Does that mean that like God audibly spoke it and then they conveyed it? We, we don't know. But to your point, even when such a firm statement as the word of the Lord came to me is used in Jeremiah 32, Jeremiah doesn't know that he knows that he knows that it's the word of the Lord until Hananel offers to buy that field, which is how the story plays out. Uh, I don't know how words, they get around that. Yeah. yeah the, the, the very, the very clear statement, then I knew it was the Lord. This is a sequence of events. And the word then literally implies when he knew. He knew after right. all everything had come to pass. The Hebrew phrase here, then I knew this was uh, the word of Yahweh. The better way to translate it, because that, that's kind of an idiom in Hebrew, the way he's saying it, he's, and, and, and this is the right way to, to understand it. Then I knew that this was what Yahweh was talking about, is how we would say it in English. Right. It, wasn't, it wasn't that Jeremiah was wondering if that was really God talking or anything like that. So what Michael Roundtree did there, he, he eisegeted. He read in his own bad theology about prophecy into that text hijacked that last sentence without even consulting the Hebrew, without consulting good commentaries, and then basically said, oh, this is an example of what I experience when, you know, I, it, God sometimes talks to, talks to me, and, it, and it's a feeling, or it might be words, or a sentence, or whatever, and, and then later I'll get confirmation. So what he did is he read his own bad theology into it, and checking a good commentary or learning Hebrew would help you a lot in that regard. Now, there was a lot more covered in that Remnant Radio episode that Justin and Chris didn't address, like the prophetic ministries of Daniel and Samuel. They pretty much just focused on the ending of Jeremiah 32.8, where it says, Then Hanamel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison, according to the word of the Lord, and said to me, Please buy my field that is in Anathoth, which is in the country of Benjamin. For the right of inheritance is yours, and the redemption yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. Most translations read like the New King James, but there are a few that would seem to support the view that the Remnant Radio guides hold. 
The New Living Translation says, Then I knew that the message I heard was from the Lord. God's Word Translation says, Then I knew that the Lord had spoken to me. The Good News Translation says, So I knew that the Lord had really spoken to me. The NET Bible says, When this happened, I recognized that the Lord had indeed spoken to me. I couldn't find any translation that says anything like, then I realized that this is what Jehovah was talking about, like Chris said. Now, Chris recommends that we read a few commentaries on this. So that's what I did. Most commentaries don't say anything about the end of the verse one way or the other, but a few do. Poole's English annotation says, I knew my former mentioned revelation was from God. Smith's Bible Commentary says, Now the incongruous part of this is that already Benjamin had fallen to Babylon, and so this field that was in question is already under Babylonian control, and they are going to be captives in Babylon for 70 years. Why would he want to redeem a field that is already under Babylonian control? So when the Lord spoke to him and said, Now buy the field, tomorrow Hanamiel, your cousin, is going to come and ask you to buy his father's field for the right of redemption is yours. Go ahead and buy it. He thought, man, is this me? Surely this can't be the Lord telling me this. Until when Hanamiel came and said, hey, my father wants you to redeem the field. The right of redemption is yours. Then I knew it was the Lord saying it. G. Campbell Morgan says, the explanation of the act given to him, and by him announced, was that this purchase of land was a sign that God would restore the land to the people. It was not a sign of Jeremiah's faith, for he was perplexed while obedient. The sign was in the command. It was God's sign to his servant. The impressive fact as to Jeremiah is that he was obedient even though perplexed. When we ask for the secret of that obedience, we find it in his assurance that the command was indeed the command of God. Now observe the reason of that certainty. He became certain when Hananiah came and urged him to buy. He had heard the word of Jehovah already, but evidently was not sure that it was his word. When the offer came to him, he was made sure. John Calvin said, he then says that Hanamiel, his uncle's son, came as Jehovah had spoken. Then he came into the court of the prison, and that he spoke to him as God had foretold. As to the end of the verse, it may seem strange that the prophet says that he now knew that the word came from God, for if he before doubted, where would be the certainty as to the prophetic spirit? He had already received a vision. He ought to have embraced what he knew had been foretold to him from above, even without any hesitation. But it appears that he was in suspense and perplexity. It then seems an evidence of unbelief that he did not put a full and all entire trust in God's testimony and was not fully persuaded as to the heavenly oracle until he saw the whole thing really accomplished. So there might be some commentaries that see it Chris's way, but there are others that don't. Chris also says that learning Hebrew would help you a lot in understanding this verse, but I think you have to assume that all of the translation I provided included Hebrew scholars. And I don't see any on the Bible Hub that translated it the way that Chris explains it. These cessationist guys are fond of saying that every time God speaks to people, it's clear and undeniable that it was indeed God. Well, all you have to do to debunk that idea is read the account of Gideon's fleece. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. 
And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. So Gideon tore down the altar to Baal and the wooden image, and the men of the city wanted to kill him. Then the Amalekites and Midianites gathered together to come against Israel. So Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, Look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it be dry only on the fleece, but on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. So the Lord told Gideon that he would defeat the Midianites, and he asked for a sign. The Lord had him make an offering that was consumed by fire coming out of a rock. Despite that, Gideon wanted another sign, so he put out a fleece and asked for it to be wet when the ground around it was dry, and that happened. But he wanted even more confirmation, so he put the fleece out again and asked that it be dry while there was dew on the ground, and that happened too. So it took three signs to convince Gideon that he had really heard from God that he would defeat the Midianites. Now, I realize that Gideon wasn't a prophet, but he did hear from God regarding the Midianites. And even a prophet like Jeremiah wasn't sure about the word that he heard, according to John Calvin and G. Campbell Morgan. Justin and Chris are really good at mocking, ridiculing, and strawmanning, but that's not how you do theology and apologetics. It might work on YouTube, but that doesn't mean it will hold up under scrutiny. Thanks for watching and be blessed.